Well, hello and welcome to Circus History Live. I'm Bruce Hawley, president of the Circus Historical Society. Circus History Live is produced monthly by the CHS. Tonight's episode features the recording of Kenneth Feld's presentation at the recent Circus Historical Society convention in Normal, Illinois. Mr. Feld's talk is entitled Reimagining the Greatest Show on Earth. Kenneth Feld is the uh, entrepreneur, entertainment entrepreneur who has been the creative and business force be behind Feld Entertainment for more than 50 years. He joined the company in 1970 after his father, Irvin, founded it in 1967 with the acquisition of Ringling Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey Circus. Starting with Phineas Taylor Barnum in 1871, the phrase, the greatest show on earth has been synonymous with circus for more than 150 years. As historians, we have studied how the Barnum and Bailey Circus and later Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey made sure that their show was the greatest on earth by continually changing their operations to keep up with changing times, technology and tastes. Tonight, you have a unique opportunity to listen to uh, Kenneth Feld, who is the current steward of The Greatest Show on Earth, in his presentation about reimagining The Greatest Show on Earth to meet the needs of a new generation of circus audiences. Before we play the recording, however, I would like to thank CHS Vice President Chris Berry for arranging to have Mr. Feld attend the convention. As you will see, Chris also interviewed Mr. Feld. I would also like to thank CHS trustee Anya Norris for filming and editing the recording of Mr. Feld's presentation. Anya also handles the marketing of Circus History Live, as well as pl placing the recordings on the CHS YouTube channel. And now here's the host of Circus History Live, Chris Berry. Chris? Thanks, Bruce. We're going to get right into this. But, you know, I wanted to just kind of uh, preface it by saying that when we all learned that Ringling Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey was going to be coming back this year, I think we all had a lot of questions, a lot of questions. And there was a lot of uh, information and even disinformation that came out. So uh, I'm very pleased that Mr. Feld has joined us to uh, answer some of those questions. Don't know if he'll answer all of them, but I hope that by the end of this program, you'll have a better understanding of what we can expect when the greatest show on earth reopens later this month. So Anya, let's roll it. So uh, when I asked Mr. Feld to join us today, uh, it was an enthusiastic yes. And I think part of that is because of the fact that the circus beats deep inside of you. Uh, you mentioned the fact that he's been involved for more than 50 years. You, you mentioned, mentioned the fact that he's been involved for more than 50 years. It's much more than that, I think, as I, as I get to know you uh, more. Uh, it's, it's really a part of who you are and how excited we are that you're bringing the circus back. No, first of all, thank you all for inviting me. I'm happy to be here and I know a lot of you from some from many years ago, some from more recent times, but uh, I'm really happy to be here. And it's exciting because we have the Greatest Show on Earth opening the 29th of September in wonderful Bossier City, Louisiana, uh, which uh, <clears throat> will be interesting to see. But I, before I get into anything, and I'm happy to answer questions and talk about whatever you want to talk about, I want to show you a short video that was probably done within the past two or three days <coughs> at rehearsal. Great. Let's roll it. That was just a few days ago. Now, you have, in, in Ellington there, you have uh, a couple of stages that are as large as Madison Square Garden. Uh, you fill it up. Tell us a little bit about what you're seeing there, the acts that you're seeing, and what we can expect when we see the show. Okay, I wanted you to see that before we talked about it, because it's, it, we're in a business of um, showing, not telling. And it's very hard to visualize when we said we're bringing back the greatest show on earth, but it's a completely different format. And what's interesting is the space there is a hockey ring. It's 180 feet by 80 feet. And we fill the whole space. And we have, we don't have three rings. We have five staging areas. 
Uh, one happens to be circular. Uh, one is a stage that's 17 feet, one is 14 feet. And what we did in designing the show uh, was really interesting. So we used a lot of virtual reality. So what we did is we went and we took the 20 major venues in the country that we play and virtually we literally sat in every seat in the arena to figure out where was a blind spot, where could people see, couldn't they, what could we do. We wound up changing the dimensions of the height on things so that we could accommodate more people in more good seats. So it was something 25 years ago we couldn't have done because it didn't exist. And now we utilize that to make it better for the consumer when they come. And that was sort of the beginning of this. And obviously, as everybody knows, we have no animals in the show. We do have a lot of people. We have a cast of 75 people. And the thought process in putting the show together, and I must say, uh, Juliet, my daughter who's producing the show, she came up with this idea of let's create the world's biggest playground for all these performers. And that's what we did. And the 75 performers, it's not like one act and one act and one act. It is literally the entire show is about the people. And they do different things. They work together. And you will see um, throughout the show different displays, whether it's aerial, whether it's ground, whether it's bicycles. We've done a lot of new things. Um, and we have performers from 18 different countries. And, you know, we it's the first time. Well, actually, there was another first time, which was in 1968 for 69 when we built the uh, second unit, what was became the red unit of Ringing Brothers Barn and Bailey. But what we did is we basically replicated the infrastructure of what we had with what was the blue unit at that time, or the, the only unit. And uh, then we, we created a new train and all these other things. But here, we had no infrastructure. So we've been off the road, we closed since 2017, so we've been off the road six and a half years, so it'll be seven years by the time we do the full tour, seven, seven and a half years that people hadn't seen really. So the idea was what can we do when someone walks in the arena before they see anything of the show that's going to blow them away? And we, we hired some really great talent, great production designer, and they came up with this idea of this playground. And you'll notice the color scheme is quite different. You can see it. That's why I wanted to show you the video first. You get a little sense of it. I know it's just flashes of it. But it works um, in many, many ways. So we've also combined video. But the one thing, and I don't know how many of you got it, music concerts where they have video and things like that. But the problem is the tendency is you're looking at the video instead of the performer on stage. And if you're in a stadium, like if I'm sure all of you went to the Taylor Swift show someplace, right? <laughs> and you would go there and you would see Taylor Swift about this high and then you could watch on the video and she would be larger than this room. So then what you would do, because your eye does it for you, you don't even do it consciously, you wind up watching Taylor Swift. She's live, but you're watching the video. And then like, so why did you go? So the video is used as an enhancer. And we actually have two aerial video screens that are circular. And what it does, it allows for people in every part of the arena to see what's going on. But so for instance, if you have someone on one side of the arena 
and they're working and they're doing a balancing act. Well, on the other screen that's closest to the other side, you would see images of what they're doing. But it also helps in many ways because we use it as abstracts for where we can put different design elements, uh, different art, different things that change the landscape and change what you're seeing and how you're seeing it. But we never diminish the people, the performers. So what you might see, a high wire act, extraordinary high wire act. But what's the point of view that none of us get to see? Some of us are, were performers. Being on the wire. <clears throat> but being on the wire. So you can see, you'll have shots of the feet on the wire. There are other things that are unique that make it interesting. Because the idea, and I'm going to jump around a little bit today, <clears throat> but the idea is this. And I, I did say this recently, if anybody was in Monte Carlo, but uh, the circus is like Christmas, right? Comes around once a year, everybody celebrates. And everybody says, that's great. But it's not great. It only comes around once a year. Circus should be in everybody's life every day. So how do we do that? We have to show them that the most extraordinary people in the world are circus performers. And how do we do that? We give them a peek into everybody or the look or things that they don't see, but they're people like all of us, but they're extraordinary. So there's that possibility. And we want people to live circus every day. We want to build a franchise. Ringling is a great name, it's a great show, but the show is only part of what we're doing. And, you know, the worst thing that happened to anybody was COVID because <clears throat> things, everything shut down. But it was a blessing in some ways. And a lot of it was we had time to think. Uh, we initially were going to reopen. Ringling in 2021, which would have been the 150th anniversary. Uh, with COVID, it pushed it back two years later to 2023. So the reason why I'm getting to all of this is think about the audience. The audience now, they're kids that are nine years old that never saw Ringling, probably never heard about it or anything else. They're new parents that never had the opportunity to take their kids to see Ringling. And they're new grandparents that never got to take their new grandkids. So generationally, it's almost a whole different uh, situation. So everybody here and your historians, so part of that is looking back and appreciating everything that was. and being in business, and it's not to disparage anybody because what you do is so important, so wonderful, but I can only look forward. And I never look back. So I'm looking forward at this great opportunity for all new people that have never seen it. They have no preconceived ideas. And if you look at what's happened in our country, and geopolitically, and I don't, it's not politics, but also with COVID, it changed. There's really been nothing in our history, at least in my lifetime, that has changed our habits. There have been crises, there have been all the things that have happened, but for two years, we changed, all of us, and I don't care who we are, what we did, we changed habits. That's unique in our culture and so we have to change what people want to see and how they see it and the blessing is being in the live entertainment business that's the one thing people missed and they there's no substitute for live entertainment whatever the genre of it might be and it's family entertainment too i mean that's one of the things when we see on the sizzle reel you know, these are families that you're bringing out for live entertainment right now. 
and the circus, as you say, I mean, you know, we, we think of the circus that we grew up with, just as our parents think of the circus they grew up with, our grandparents, great-grandparents. But the thing is, as much as we love it, as much as we're going to buy a ticket, it's family entertainment. It's bringing your kids out, right? It is, and it's everything that we do, because the one thing and the greatest thing about our business is anytime someone is born, they're a potential customer. So the, the burden's on us to get them to see, to get them to participate, to get them to have a passion like all of you have for the circus. It came from something. It wasn't like one day just, oh, I think that's a good thing to do. You experienced something that became indelible and you wanted to pursue it and constantly delve into it and make it more. And that's what we want, but we have to create the place to do it. So we have to create not the circus of yesterday, and it doesn't mean we forget about all that, but we have to create the circus of tomorrow and the circus that no one could comprehend. Because I see all this stuff and people are like, how can you have a circus with this or without this or this? But, you know, what is the circus? Greatest thing about it, there are no rules. There have never been any rules. So we can do anything we want. And the only thing that matters is how do we entertain the customer? How do we entertain the consumer? What do they like? What do they want to see? And we've had, I would say, six and a half years almost to do research. And yes, we do a lot of research, I must tell you. From the day we closed, every three months, we would run market research around the country to see the relevance of Ringling because you think maybe it would change. We were blown away. We were up there with Coca-Cola, with Walt Disney, and Ringling. So, and I think your brand was older than any of those. <laughs> uh, I think you're right. Yeah. <laughs> but... The, the gratifying thing is that people want it to come back, they want to see it, and it'll be in a completely different form. But the, what, what I will say is that the concept, and I see a couple of people that have been on the show before working, <coughs> is quite different. It's not about an act working and another act working. It's about a unification of 75 talented individuals that all do different things that are working together and that is the ethos that we want to bring because what we're doing and if you think about today and you think about all of this stuff going on in the world this is the basics this is simple fun that has been forgotten in many places so we're going to bring that back, and it's about the people that make it simple fun and what they do and how do you enjoy it and how do we take something that was one way. And we, have, we do have people that have been with Ringling before on that. We have the Lopez family with Iowa Act. And so we went to them and we said, what can you do different? How can you take this to a new level? So... The High Wire Act in the show is extraordinary. It's a triangle. It's three high wires in a triangle. So you get to see everybody working together in a whole different way than what you've seen on a wire act. And it plays to everybody. And it's, it's just unbelievable when you see it. And, and this is coming from a guy, you know, I always like to say this. When you take a look at circus history in the United States, and Bruce mentioned you've been involved since 1970. Your name as mm -hmm. producer has been involved at least since 1985 solely as the producer. You have produced more circuses than anybody. More circuses than P.T. Barnum, more circuses than the Ringling Brothers, anybody. You always had at least two shows out. You, you make me feel so sometimes old. Sometimes had three. <laughs> so old. So, oh, I, yeah. want to talk about, I want to talk about the new show a lot, actually. Yeah. But I think that, especially for this group, how did we get here? You know, the entertainment business is a business first, right? Well, it's entertainment business. So it's two things, and I don't think you can have one without the other. But I think it's 
Interesting. So when we closed Ringling in 2017, everybody thinks because they read a headline in January of um, uh, 2017 that we were going to close in May. And it's you read the headline, you said, oh, that must have happened last night, you know, like I had a thought. But we knew that we, we had to close. The system, how we traveled, the train system in this country, and we, we read a lot about stuff that was inevitable, and Mike Nelson knows all about this stuff very well. But we had to do something different. And also, it's really similar. When my dad got involved with Ringling, was 1957, the first year he promoted it. And it was like, uh, there they had a couple uh, stadium shows, but it was mostly in venues. And like, Ringling had always played in Madison Square Garden, it was built for them, and then the Boston Garden. And then everything else, I think, was in the tent. Well, the tent was wonderful, but now cities were expanding. There was no place to put the kind of acreage that they had. But the other thing is that you're spending a fortune on the tent. But what are you doing? You're robbing your audience of where you could be spending money that they would see it and appreciate it. It was no different with the circus train. And that, you know, we were getting, uh, it was later and later. Uh, and there were a lot of other things that came to pass. It's an antiquated, we we're in a 146 year old business model in essence. So we had to change it. And you can't change it on the run. So we, we closed and then we started to think about it, then COVID hit, but it was an opportunity. How often in life do you have a chance to start with a blank piece of paper and create something new? So it's really gratifying. We've been working for six and a half years to get it almost to where it is today. And it's going to be different. And some people will love it. Some people will have other comments about it. But that isn't the point. The point is we're going to entertain people. And one thing that we've done, and the reason why we can do all the things we do, is we're flexible. And we listen to the audience. And whatever the audience says, or how they respond, we'll go and we'll adapt and we'll make the changes and it's a work in progress and we'll get it to where it is. And that happens with every single production that we do. But this is an opportunity and it's an opportunity for people to see something that's unique, it's different, and it has all the pillars of what Ringling stands for. And that will be evident when all of you come and see it, where, wherever you come. So, um, you know, a lot of the questions that you talked about earlier, uh, which I think are things that we've all thought about, um, people say, oh, this is going to be another Cirque du Soleil. I saw the venue. I saw these stages. Your center ring is as big as anything you would see in Cirque du Soleil. It's actually, I mean, all of you know, you know, typical 40-foot uh, um, diameter. So this is about uh, 45 feet, but what the, the un another unique thing is it's an elevated stage which has turntables, has elevators in it, and it has uh, it on the perimeter in it, you know, if you just saw it, it looks like, oh, that's like black ramps or something. So they're all video screens that incorporate the act. So if you think about it, I go back to the Taylor Swift on the uh, video. Here, we have the ability to enhance what anybody's doing, and it's below them. So the people are always dominant. And this is about people, performers, uh, and the artists that we have. And this is for fun, to entertain families. We're not it's going to be paced very well. It's quick. It's exciting. It's uh, expect the unexpected. And that's basically what it is with unique acts 
and an extraordinary cast, and they're presented in ways that most people have never seen before or never seen before. And reta retaining the comedy, the um, involvement, and the ability to really engage the audience uh, where every show is going to be different and they have, will have the ability to take home a video of things that were their special in their particular performance. And so there's a lot of technology not used to do anything but enhance the experience. Again, you know, you said this is an entirely new, reimagined, greatest show on earth. A lot of the people in this room here, you know, they think about things like logistics and stuff like that. When you talk about the fact that you had this 146-year-old business model that had to change, one of the things that, of course, everybody feels nostalgic about is the train. We pulled in here and there was an Amtrak train coming in, but I got to tell you, there aren't a lot of places where there are great roadbeds for trains these days. This show is going to move differently. It sounds to me as though what you said earlier about the things that the, you're paying for things that the audience never saw. I know that these trains would come into town. You had a train crew that was there all week while the, while the performance was going on, and you still have to pay their salary. So how's this show going to move, and why is a train not an option? The train is not an option because we would travel primarily on our freight rails. They did not want any live cargo because they could never promise when you would get to the next town. And what's happened with the venues across America, and especially with the NBA and NHL venues, that they have said they do not want to play back-to-back -back games. So what that means is it eats up more time in a week, so it's less time for us. So we have to be more efficient, we have to get in quicker uh, <clears throat> than we did before because you cannot uh, get the venues anymore. So uh, we will travel, the people will travel by plane and bus depending upon distances. Uh, the, uh, the sets, everything else will travel uh, by semis. And um, it's, you know, every day we're in the process. Uh, I guess we've been in one form of rehearsal or not since about the beginning of June. Uh, to understand it, because again, I go back, there was no infrastructure, there wasn't a light bulb. There was nothing that we had that we could reutilize, nor did we really want to. So everything is new. Everything is state-of-the-art. The sound is, uh, system is pretty unique. It's actually directional. So wherever a person is that is speaking or singing or whatever it might be, um, you will hear the sound, and that will lead you. So you'll hear the sound from over here, and you'll look there, and that's the focus. So it works in tandem with the lighting, and it is, uh, for arenas especially, it's sort of a unique uh, way of um, getting you much more into the uh, environment, the situation than would have been available even seven years ago. You know, uh, if if we were to have a cert, if Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey were to come here in the old business model, you couldn't have elephants in the state of Illinois. You can't even bring an elephant across the state of Illinois now. You know, a lot of people, we talk about the animal rights activists, and I just want to remind everybody, you were the guy that fought the animal rights activists, you were the guy that beat the animal rights activists, and they had to pay a lot of money to you, but I, I know that it was very difficult for you during that time, but now the business has to change. The business always had to change. Every business has to change. And the only constant in life is change. And we have to understand what do the people want. It, you know, if you think about humor and clowning, you cannot do some of the most famous clown gags are totally inappropriate to do now. Farming gag. If you, you're going to throw a baby out from the roof down, I mean, they're going to chase you out of town. I mean, there is no way that's not funny anymore. So we have to go and we have to figure out what is funny, what is humorous, how can we do it, how can we adapt it? 
you know, clowns. And, I, you know, I must say, my dad had, I think, I'll attribute it to him. I think he, I think he said it. Uh, when we were, he was planning the second unit, and he said, we don't have enough clowns. And I think the average age of the clowns on the show at that point was probably 60 plus. And he said, you know, I know these clowns can fall down, but can they get up? <laughs> and, and that was the genesis of Clown College, of why he needed to do it. But now we go fast forward, and what's happened, and this is global. I mean, think of all the movies, think of, did Fear of Clowns really exist then? I mean, now, this is a big thing. So, but it's not about clowns and makeup or wigs or anything like that. It's about what is funny, what is humorous, what are people today going to laugh at? And this is what we've done. We've converted that and we have, there's four of the funniest people I know on this show and they're funny and we're non-lingual entertainment, so it's not telling a joke or anything. They're just physically funny with how they are and who they are and what they do. And that is the basic for it. It doesn't, you don't have to have makeup. You don't have to have a red nose. That's not relevant. What's relevant is what is the message that the audience is getting. And if they can laugh, I gotta tell you, it's pretty rare today. People don't laugh. There's not a lot of this happiness and fun. This is what we want to bring. This is the essence of everything. Well, you know, uh, and just to talk about the clowns a little bit, you mentioned there are four. Uh, Jan Dom, who uh, is somebody that many of you may have seen before, he's a funny guy. I would call him a clown. Charlie Chaplin was a clown. Bello Nock is a clown. But Bello Nock did a lot more than just, you know, put on the white face and the big red nose. He was, he was an extraordinary performer, and that's kind of what you've done when you've hired you know, this group, these three Ukrainians who won awards in Monte Carlo and now they're gonna be on your show. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because they are uh, three of the funniest people I've ever seen in my life. And they're funny from afar and they're funny close up. So that must mean they're funny. And, and they don't speak English? Uh, they speak a little English, <laughs> they do. But everything that they look at, it's a sense of humor. And it's just, when people can think funny, then that's true to the heart. And then they have the skill set, which I think in many ways, it's harder to be uh, a comedian that can, because you have to be so good at what you do to make it look not good. And um, so it is a big skill. And I think uh, they're great and they have a great way with people, and you see them, and you laugh, but you also like them, and that's, that's a whole thing. So it's a different pace of it, but it's a constant thread, and uh, we're gonna see. You know, it's exciting for me because my favorite day is gonna be when we get an audience in there, and we'll see what works, and we'll get surprised, and we always do, and it's exciting to be able to have Ringling coming back, have the interest that we've seen, and it is gonna be new and different, and we will hear everything there is to be heard, but the one thing I know, there isn't gonna be anybody that walks away from there that didn't have a good time, that if you think about it, the most precious thing we have is conversation today. What we do when you're leaving the show and you're on your way home, we created a conversation with the family in the car. And if there are four people and each of them likes something else the most, then we're a huge success. And that's what we look for. And that's what we have to do. And it's fun doing it. It takes a long time. There's a lot of thought. And the one thing I know, this looks different. When people walk into the arena, they are not going to believe the scale of this entire set that takes up really, literally every inch of the floor space. Yeah, there's no real backstage, uh, is there? The backstage is on stage, it's underneath, because both of the end performance uh, 
uh, spaces have elevators in them, lifts, and uh, so there's everything is in the air. It comes from underneath and up, and then we have uh, crazy stuff. So we have a lot BMX bikers and other bikers, and we have a trampoline act on bicycles and stuff that hasn't been seen. It's exciting. The pace is going to be great and. It's, it's going to be a great experience. So let's talk a little bit about, I mean, you have hired a lot of acts in your, your time. You and your father, you know, Gunther Gable Williams, finding him. Tell me about, there's been a lot made of these auditions that were held all over the world. How did that work? We were in about, I think, eight or ten countries. The one thing, unfortunately, I would have loved to go on, but... Yeah, I, we now have much better people than I ever was doing all this stuff. We well, so, have a much larger business now too. Uh, a little bit, <laughs> and um, that worked out really well. And if you think about the world today, uh, we had a lot of options to close down, so we cannot hire Russians. Sanction. It's against the law. So it's it's tragic for so many performers, and uh, it's a shame, but we can't. China, they are not sending people out until what they said was 2026. So we cannot hire any Chinese performers. So we went, we had some great performers from Ethiopia, they have a very good school down there. Uh, we had some wonderful performers uh, from Mongolia, large troops. One of the things, this is just an aside, but I really didn't realize it at the time that we closed, but we were the largest uh, employer of large circus troops in the world. And because we had closed, so there's no demand, so the supply fell away and all of a sudden we go out and it's very difficult to find troops with eight, ten people, any place in the world. So that was a big challenge. So what we did instead, we hired, we did do have an incredible teeterboard act from Mongolia and so that's I think nine people. But what we did is that came into our thinking, well we have 75 people here in the show. So let's, that is our large troop. So they're all working in very different ways, but together. And so that's a big difference. And that's just a supply and demand situation that we didn't even realize existed in that way when, when we closed in, in the, the six years since we're reopening. Mr. Feld had agreed uh, to answer questions that you might have. Now, I've covered the big ones. The train, the clowns, the animals. We don't know. There might be bigger questions. There could be. Uh, Cirque du Soleil or whatever. So does anybody have a question they'd like to ask? And I'll bring the microphone over to you. I'm sure you, I mean, come on. you got to have questions. This is your one-on-one -on -one time. Greg Parkinson, hold it close. I have a question, Kenneth. Um, and maybe this is looking too far down the road. But my understanding of your weekly schedule, roughly, and playing Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, engagements. Do you foresee that with the hockey schedule and the NBA schedule and their off schedules that there are any of the huge American cities that you could eventually play longer stands two or three weeks in or does that just not make sense in this new model? Well, I, I can't speak for the NBA or the NHL. I wouldn't, that's somebody else's uh, problem or fun or whatever it is. <clears throat> but I know that uh, what we did in constructing this show and the set and having, it's really a full 360, so we have more capacity. If you remember in 2006, we really went to a uh, proscenium type setup, more of what our ice shows have traditionally been. <clears throat> so this is truly 360. So in places where maybe we had 7,000 appropriate seats, we'll now have maybe 12 or 13,000. So I don't need to 
maybe have more than seven performances a week. And it depends and it'll vary. But for right now, that's what it is. We have a, uh, it's basically a two and a half year tour. And then uh, we'll see where things go from there. Probably a version will go outside the US and then we'll see how many tours we wind up with here. And it's strictly, what is the demand? You know, we started, when we started Disney on Ice, when I started that in 81, we have one show. We now have nine tours of Disney on Ice around the world. All over the world. Yeah. yeah. So it just depends on what, what it is. And um, we'll see, but I think, I think the, the, form, the format works, and I'd rather have fewer shows with more people. And it's better for the performers, it's better economically, and it allows us to be able to get a tour that becomes very consistent. So Ralph Pierce from Baraboo is here. Ralph, I know you used to uh, cook food for Tom College when I was up there, but uh, that's probably not what you're going to ask about. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Notoriously, in the last 30 years, going to see your show in Wisconsin, you had a tough time selling tickets in Wisconsin. But I see you're coming back to Milwaukee. So you're saying your new type of a system is going to attract a lot of different people. Because, like I said, you've had a rough time trying to attract people in Wisconsin. So your new way of doing business, you think will be successful even in towns that you had previously had difficulty with? Well, uh, I knew that um, Wisconsin was always the home of Ringling and other shows, and therefore there was was lousy business there all the time. But um, <laughs> no, I I I will tell you what's quite different is, and especially over the past six seven years, and more pronounced since COVID, the shift in demo demographics across the country, and I know. I see Mike Nelson here, so he's with the show for so long and he knows the dog towns and the good towns. And for instance, we would go into Austin, and you couldn't do any business in Austin, Texas. Now it is like off the charts great with everything. You go, I mean, so it, there have been big changes that have happened where the population is. and. You know, there's also been a big difference because we play a lot of events in the Fiserv Center in, uh, in Milwaukee, and we do incredible business now. So I think it, it depends. I, I think it's different in time of year. You know, we, if we move our routing two weeks different, it could be 30% difference in business, down or up based upon when it is. So historical dates, uh, what we call historical dates, are typically very important. But the population centers have moved to different places. And it's not just population, it's populations, a younger population with families. So I mean, Boise, Idaho, is completely different today than it was 15 years ago. I mean, we do, you do incredible business there. It was like you wouldn't even want to go there 15 years ago with an event. Uh, so those were aware of it. And, you know, the technology is great. And, you know, you can target zip codes. You know who lives where. And you can market that way. I mean, probably 90% of our marketing is, is digital now. Jerry Severson has a question for you. Uh, Circus performers work hard to develop and act, and you also have to deal with a refreshing system that you bring to audience. That you can't bring the same thing back all the time. So how are you going to balance the fact that performers like to stay with you more than, uh, I think you mentioned maybe it's two years they could be with you. So how are you going to balance keeping it refreshed for audiences, but also being enticing to want performers to join Ringling again? Well, I think, you know, this isn't only performers. 
I mean, we're employers of about 4,000 people. And yeah, some jobs are tougher to fill. Everybody reads about that every day. But <clears throat> if you have a place that, and you care about the people that work for you, you hopefully everybody treats them well. And we do, and they want to work at a place like that. So that's performers or performers. They want to perform in the best place. We're the best place, that I know. And, you know, so that's never been an issue because we, we have all these performers. We know how to work with performers. Um, and we know how to present them, I think, in a really great way, no matter what the medium is. And that's really just how you run a business. I mean, you have people that run stores, and they're nice to people that have more customers than if they're not nice to people. And it's, I mean, it's sort of basic, I, I think. I, I don't know, but we've always tried to do that. You're never always right about things, but you, you make that attempt to treat everybody well. And what's important is, for the performers to be happy because they're the, the point of communication. There's not me, nobody cares if I'm happy or not happy or anything else. <laughs> but the performers, if they're happy, that translates to the audience. And that's what it's about. So that's that's the only way I look at it. Kenneth uh, Larry Chimino has a question. Yep. Uh, you, you talk about keeping circus in front of people all year long. I wonder if you're going to put out a series of uh, consumer goods like fragrances and uh, designer clothing and, uh, and uh, to keep these things in front of people all the time. What's your, what's your thought about that? Well, we in 2008, we acquired uh, a business from Live Nation, and it consisted of uh, Supercross, which is motorcycle racing and stadiums, and the other big element aspect of it was monster trucks. Since then, we've grown Monster Jam over a thousand percent. And a lot of that, it's not just a show, it's a franchise, <clears throat> it's a toy line, it's every possible product you can think of, there is with Monster Jam. And it's global. So we can take that pattern and hopefully create that kind of franchise to keep it top of mind uh, 365 days a year, and that's the goal. And, and you share the, I'm sorry, sorry. sorry to interrupt you, but can you share the story which you told me about how Disney on Ice came about when you went into a meeting? Yeah, I don't, well, there, nobody wants to do Well, that. I think that it, that it kind of follows this whole plot, because Walt Disney Company, through Mickey Mouse and so forth, 365 days a year, people know who he is, right? Well, that, that's for sure. But no, so we had acquired in 1979 uh, Ice Follies and Holiday on Ice. And from a technical operation compared to the circus, it was simple. You know, and uh, the routing and all the stuff that uh, we know how to do because of Ringling. Uh, but one day I'm there, and my dad, because he was so passionate about the circus, he says, we have the ice shows, you take care of that now. And so that was what I was supposed to do. And so I put together a new show, and it was, it was a great show, I'll tell you. People stayed away in droves. I mean, it was the worst <laughs> business we ever had. <laughs> And so I go on a Saturday, and I'm looking up in the audience, and I see the reflection of eyeglasses, and I see an older audience and very few kids. And I'm like, oh my God, my customer's dying. <clears throat> and you can't build a business on that, or I didn't think so, because we wanted to get families. So I went to the Disney company. This is now 1980, <clears throat> and they were as low as they had ever been. And I meet with um, a gentleman who was head of licensing for them, and he had been an animator and everything. He was a wonderful man. And I said, 
What I'd like to do is let's work out a deal and we'll do a 20 minute segment in uh, one of our ice shows and uh, you know it'll be great marketing tool and all of this and uh, he said I'm not interested Disney does isn't part of anything except for Disney and so he says but you're a nice young man and we walk out you know that's getting rejected and he's escorting me out the door and this is uh, in Burbank in Burbank and the Disney Studios and I turned around to him I said what because we had three ice shows touring at the time so what if we converted one of our ice shows and we called it Walt Disney's World on Ice what would you think and it would just be Disney characters and story he said we turned around we went back in we <laughs> talked about it literally in two weeks I had a contract for Disney on Ice, which we opened the following July in uh, with the, at the Meadowlands in New Jersey, and that was one tour, and we were on a year-to-year -year contract with them, and ultimately it evolved into something, and in we just finished our 42nd year with having Disney on Ice, and I'll give you a number. In 42 years of Disney on Ice, we have played to 300 million, 600,000 paid customers in 80 countries. But and the point is, people know when you come to town, they know it. They know it. And we are, in many of these countries, the only Disney presence that happens. And so we are the ambassador for Disney in that sense. And we're also now, I would say, probably the longest or the second or third longest licensee of the Disney company. Uh, so we have, and the great thing about a non-public family business is we think in decades. And we made this huge investment in Ringway. We have great faith that it's going to come back. Uh, but I'm not worried about this year or next year. But we look ahead, what can it be? Never look at something as it is, but as it can be. And that's been a philosophy that I've had. I mean, when I went to Monster Jam, everybody said, this is the worst, there's no way. We built this into something that is a global juggernaut now. We did the same thing this year, and it took a long time with our motorsports business. So we now created a league with 31 events versus 17 events, and we have a playoffs and a world championship. We got, like they quadrupled our whole TV deal, and we're streaming on Peacock or on NBC or CNBC or whatever it's gonna be every week and we stream it in 144 countries. So <clears throat> we're building it. And you know, it takes time. And Ringling, it's a whole new generation. People are gonna have to get used to it. We'll have the people that remember it, that wanna come back. We'll have the people that love it. We'll have the people that think otherwise. But you know what? As long as they come, as long as we can entertain them, that's what we're in business for. Wayne McCurry, I think, is gonna have the last question for you. Okay. First, thank you for being here, Kenneth. Um, I wondered how your, what kind of a marketing strategy you plan to use to attract this new, younger generation audience? So we started the marketing long before we started the show. And um, so we've been on sale. I don't know, I think that our on sale was maybe last March for the first half of the tour anyway and so what we do we didn't realize so you go out and you want to get a database so you wind up paying for them and it's by the head so to speak and then it's the more people you get it wound up we just got flooded with people interested and yes we target uh and like i think all of you know if you bought anything online uh they got you now for life, <laughs> and, and 
that's how we get the word around because that's our audience. If you think about moms and dads with kids four to 12 years old, uh, they're not reading newspapers, they're not watching linear TV, so you don't want to be in any of those places, but they are online and we know different sites, there are different influencers that we work with uh, through, throughout the year for families and things. And, and you grow and you build it and it's word of mouth and we have uh, and Sabrina is here who is uh, responsible for a lot of our uh, corporate uh, and communications with all of our events and we get incredible uh, coverage and people like it, they're fascinated by it. And remember, Ringling is an iconic brand. The fact that we're coming back and there was a lot of thought that went into the new logos and the look of things where it works for people today. They're not looking at uh, the typeface, they're not looking at the graphics that, that we have historically, but we're looking at things that we hope will sell. And by the way, we could be completely wrong. And that's also life, but I mean, we, we have great faith in it, passion, and we do uh, put a lot of resources behind everything we do. And Peggy Williams actually yeah. has the last word. Oh. Okay, really, two quick things. I saw on the on the sizzle reel there um, a live drummer. Is that part of the rehearsal? Is that part of the performance? And the the real big question is when we all go to the box office very soon to buy a ticket for one of your shows or wherever the circus is, how do we find the the good seats? I mean, <laughs> not front track, not back track. Goddamn. I mean, what do you tell your box offices about where the best seats are? Well, every, if you're there, every seat's a good seat. <laughs> but uh, your question about the drummers and rehearsalers, uh, he's rehearsing now, and he will be in the show. <clears throat> and uh, it's a very incredible setup that, that we have with it. And he is, uh, has a drum set in the air, and it's a lot of very cool stuff. So there's some things I want to tell you, but I know all of your <laughs> secrets. So, okay. uh, Kevin Bell, thank you for joining thank us. You. Uh, this is always a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, the opportunity to sit with all of these people who, uh, like you, the circus is deep inside of them. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. And. Thank you for joining us uh, for this episode of Circus History Live. I hope that uh, you've learned a little bit more about uh, what we will be seeing when the greatest show on earth reopens uh, later this month. Uh, Circus History Live is a monthly presentation from the Circus Historical Society. Uh, we urge you to join us each month and also watch uh, previous episodes on YouTube. And also, if you have interest in joining the CHS, circushistory.org has lots of information, including our archives of bandwagon and other uh, features that are available to members. Bruce. Thank you, Chris. And thank you, Anya. And thank you everyone for coming tonight. And I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Um, I can tell you that the folks at the convention really enjoyed having Kenneth there. He was very uh, accessible. A lot of folks talked with him after his presentation. Uh, he was also interviewed by local media, including national public radio so uh, it's exciting. And as I said at the outset, the reason The Greatest Show on Earth has been around for 140 years, or more than actually, more than 150 years, is because it's changed with the times. And uh, what we're seeing, this is an historic event, I think, from a circus perspective, as the show again morphs. So again, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, it, it, we'll have a recording of this on the YouTube channel tomorrow, for those of you who, who missed it or missed parts of it. And uh, please let your friends know they could watch it there as well. So if you're not already a member, please consider joining the CHS. Good night, everyone. <laughs>